ASMR well trim platforms. We're doing these on uh, Skinny Atlas, Seneca, and Owasco lakes. We wanted to represent the gradient of conditions um, that we see in the Finger Lakes, and we wanted to measure them all using the exact same approach. And so we worked with DC to um, design these platforms um, where we're collecting um, everything that we could put on there and the patients. Um, we really put that into how what we wanted to do, and so the heart is the platform. Um, on top of that platform, we have we're collecting meteorology meteorological data. Um, we have um, sensors located at three depths beneath the platform, one near the surface, one at the middle of the water column, one at the bottom. Um, those are collecting a variety of different water quality measurements, including um, temperature, conductance, oxygen, pH, and a couple of different album metrics. And we opted for those three depths instead of a profiler so that we could see what was happening all the time at those depths rather than something that's moving and we may miss something we selected those three depths to capture what's going on throughout the water column and what we might be missing at those three depths we also have thermistor strings um, where we're looking at light and temperature and we have those every meter um, we also have webcams um, that are taking pictures and transmitting those and then to complement this, we're collecting um, discrete samples. Our sensors are measuring uh, data about every 15 minutes. Some of them are higher frequency. Um, I also forgot to mention that near the surface, at the, at the near surface uh, location, we're also using sensors to measure nutrients, uh, nitrate and phosphorus, as well as using a multispectral thermometer to look at our community composition. And then we also have the ADCPs that we heard about from the Jefferson Project on these platforms as well. So this is the, the high resolution data. And we wanted the high resolution data because we, as we've heard about, all the blooms are dynamic. And we're talking about microorganisms that are responding to things at a very small time scale that we can't capture with our discrete sampling. Um, so we have that information and we're coupling it with discrete sampling every other week. And um, there, we're collecting samples at all three depths, looking at our basic water quality parameters like nutrients and algal biomass. Um, but we're also looking at algal community composition at those three depths. We're looking for algal toxins. And then we're also looking at um, genetics. We're looking for the cyanotoxin synthetase genes. So, um, and how that relates to algal community composition. We're also doing work, some. Uh, some other work to look at when those genes are turning on and off so we know what organisms are there and what they're doing and how they're responding to changing environmental conditions. And we're also doing some pilot work with passive samplers to look for presence of toxins when we aren't out there collecting the samples. So all of these, um, again I alluded to this, um, Really, when we're looking at what we're focused on is algal biomass, because that's what we can see. The toxins are what we care about from a public health perspective, but really what we can measure right now with sensors is algal biomass. And so there are all kinds of interacting um, factors, uh, the physical analogy, which we heard a lot about uh, from the Jefferson Project, um, temperature, light, and nutrients all go into um, making up our algal biomass in the system. Um, and then the algal biomass in turn inf affects some of the other measure things that we're looking at. And so there's a lot of feedback loops here. Um, we're looking at the major controlling factors on algal biomass and then looking at how algal biomass affects some of the other aspects of the system. Um, all of the sensor data that we're collecting is available online in real time, so anyone can go look at it. Um, there's a, a website here that we developed specifically for this project. Um, we're also working with partners in New Jersey, so we've added some of their sites to this as well. Um, but this is a, a site worth exploring. Um, all the data are there, the images are there, so if you're interested in what your site looks like, you can go, um, you can go check that out. Uh, the platforms um, are out of the water right now. We did not leave them in over the winter. Um, they will be redeployed in the spring. Um, and Skinny Atlas, um, we had our offshore site and we also had a near shore location at, uh, at the pier. 
And so I'm just going to highlight um, just a few of the things that we've seen, the types of things that we're seeing with these. We're still waiting on results from our more discrete samples. We'll see those um, by the end of March. We'll have those and really begin to tie all of these pieces together. But I just wanted to highlight some, exa some examples of what we can see um, with our sensors. And we've heard a lot about the internal stationing. And that, that's a phenomenon in all of these lakes. Um, we saw it in all three that we measured. This is an example. At Owasco, and you're looking at um, near surface temperature, temperature at the middle of the water column, and temperature near the bottom. And you can see in the mid water column um, where you would see that sage, water temperatures are highly variable. And one of the things that was really striking to us was how much water temperatures could change at that depth and how rapidly they change. So we were seeing um, changes of over 10 degrees on a very short time period. So this is a phenomenon, <coughs> an important phenomenon. Um, an important aspect of the physical limnology in these lakes. Um, in Owasco Lake, the uh, Finger Lakes Institute does have a profiler that is um, at a different location than our fixed site, and it's nice to show that um, we're seeing the same types of phenomena um, using the two different approaches, the profiler as well as just the dis discrete depth sounds. And um, you get different resolutions of data um, in that way. And so you can see in the upper right, we're getting a higher resolution picture of some of the complexity that we see when we look at um, into the fall when we're starting to see lake destratification. And we can see it at a higher resolution than we can with the vertical profiler because we're at the same depth all the time. Um, one of the things we talked on a little bit, just a little bit about the fluorescence sensors and what they do, and they can be um, quite helpful when we are looking at harmful algal blooms. And when we work with continuous sensor data, a lot of times we like to see clean patterns. Usually we'll see clean patterns, um, increases or decreases, and our fluorescence sensor data um, is very noisy. And over time, we've learned that these noisy patterns um, are actually quite important in helping us identify when harmful algal blooms may be occurring, because that's actually algal biomass moving back and forth in, in front of those sensors. And so this example here, um, where you have a, um, a relatively calm period followed by noise, that was a clear indication there of the onset of the harmful algal bloom season. <laughs> Um, one of the challenges in interpreting this kind of data and why our discrete samples for algal community composition will always be important is that algal fluorescence depends on what organisms are there and the health of the organisms that are there. So in this particular example here on the bottom, um, algal abundance actually didn't change in this particular system. We just shifted from a large body cyanobacteria to a smaller uh, unicellular cyanobacteria. So the number of organisms didn't change. We saw a shift in community composition. And without those discrete sample data, we may have thought that our bloom season was over. Rather, we just had a shift. Um, our cameras have been really powerful. And this is an approach that USGS has used across the country. We discussed earlier this morning the value of the, the camera images that are taken by um, volunteers, there's, you know, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, this is an example from the Skinny Atlas Pier uh, in, 20, uh, in fall of 2018, where we saw a peak. So the, the red here, this is our buoy that was actually out in the lake. Um, the pink is the near shore uh, sensor. And we saw the peak there in our fluorescent signal. Um, that was coupled with a camera image that showed that there was, in fact, a bloom occurring there. And so, again, that was online in real time. We could look at that and say, um, perhaps we need to, to collect a sample or be aware that something is happening here. Um, another thing when we're looking at um, fluorescent sensors and algal biomass is that um, diurnal patterns don't always equate to changes in algal biomass, so this is something we're cautious of when we're using those data, is that um, algae will fluoresce more at night because they, they're not photosynthesizing, they're, they're resting. And so um, just because you see uh, diurnal variability does not necessarily mean your algal biomass is changing. So here the black line is 
chlorophyll, um, fluorescence, and red is just light intensity. You can see a pretty nice inverse relation there. So um, our fluorescence sensors do have value and utility. We need to be cautious in how we interpret those data and look at those patterns over time and with respect to other data that we're seeing. And finally, we did hear uh, a lot about the acoustics data. Um, the acoustics and water quality are really fascinating in these systems. We're able to see things in ways that we weren't, see them, see, weren't able to see them before. Being able to visualize the seiches using this kind of information is just really fascinating to me um, as a limnologist. And there are other things that we may be able to pick up with the acoustic data and water quality. Um, in this particular example, uh, from Seneca Lake in 2018, we see um, increased noise uh, in the water column that's associated with an uptick in turbidity. So again, indicative of a turbidity type event. And looking at some data again from Seneca Lake in 2018, um, there does appear to be a connection there between um, the amount of noise we're seeing in the water column and mm -hmm. our um, chlorophyll fluorescent signals. So there may be some connections there with water quality that are worth further exploration and really um, uh, using our discrete data to understand what we're seeing there in that acoustic 